today on Grace To You. If you understand anything about grace, you know that grace gives, right? God gives by grace. You can't talk about grace without talking about giving. God's grace always gives. It is the nature of divine grace to give. Grace gives what is necessary, what is needed, but what is undeserved. What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We come again to the Word of God and to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to show you what the measure of a church is, how you evaluate a church's authenticity by having you follow as I read Ephesians 4, starting in verse 7, and I'll read down to verse 16. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives, and He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is Himself also He who ascended far above all the heavens, so that He might fill all things. And He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love." Now clearly, the high point of that text is in verse 13, and there it says that the measure of the church is the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. There's only one way to measure a church, and that is its Christ-likeness. Again, that makes the duty of the church, verse 15, to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. The measure of a church is its Christ-likeness. Now we've been talking a lot about unity since the beginning of chapter 2, really. We've been talking about how important the unity of the faith is, and we see it again in verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And how is the unity of the faith there described? As the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So the unity of our faith is a common Christ-likeness, and it works like a body, verse 12 ends with the body of Christ. Verse 16 talks about the whole body, the building up of the body, the growth of the body. So Paul's image here is, is of a body. Down in verse 16, he even talks about each and every joint and the proper working of each individual part which causes the growth of the body. So we have a very simple illustration. Body, the body of a human being, functions well when all the individual components that make up that body function well. If uh, something's wrong with 
a functioning organ on the inside or a functioning limb on the outside or something in the brain, whatever it might be, the body is in a sense of dysfunction. So we understand the illustration, like a body, you have to have all the component parts to have one whole healthy body. And that's how the church works. Our unity is found in our diversity. Our unity is found in our diversity. All the various people with all their uniqueness, functioning in diverse ways, contribute to the unity of the church like all the features of a human body contribute to the united functioning of a human being. So the key to unity is diversity. That's a popular word these days, the diversity of the church. It doesn't come from collection of sins, personal experiences, and political viewpoints. What what is the source of the diversity of the church? Let's look at verse 7. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. To each one of us as individual believers. Grace was given in the form of a gift from Christ. Now if you understand anything about grace, you know that grace gives, right? God gives by grace. You can't talk about grace without talking about giving. God's grace always gives. It is the nature of divine grace to give. Grace gives what is necessary, what is needed, but what is undeserved. Now we understand that at salvation we receive saving grace. This is far more than that. This is the grace of all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. Chapter 2 and verse 5 speaks about us being saved by grace. Chapter 2 at the end of verse 5, by grace you have been saved, and then it's repeated again in verse 8, by grace you have been saved, that's saving grace. But go over to chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8. Paul, talking about his call to ministry, said he was made a minister in verse 7, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. So. He received saving grace, we understand that, but He also received the gift of grace that defined His ministry. He says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. And what we just read in the fourth chapter in verse 7 is that God's grace gives every one of us a gift for the sake of the building of the body of Christ. Paul's ministry was a gift of grace. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. Not only what I am as a believer, but what I am as a minister. I was given saving grace, and then on top of that, that saving grace lavished me with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, and on top of that, that grace gave me a gift to function within the church so that I would be part of the necessary operation of the Spirit through the multiple gifts to build the church into Christ-likeness. This grace really is God giving Himself. This grace doesn't come to us apart from God. This grace comes to us because God comes to us. And and Paul has made that absolutely clear. Go go back to chapter 1 again at the end of the chapter. We're talking here about Christ, and it says concerning Him, He's, verse 22, He's the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. (laughs) 
So the grace comes because the Lord comes. He fills His church. In uh, chapter 2, at the end of that chapter, verses 21 and 22, it says, "'We are a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit.'" So in chapter 1 at the end, Christ is in us, the fullness of Him. In chapter 2 at the end, the Spirit is in us. Look at the end of chapter 3. And here we find verse 20 and 21, now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And again, this encompasses the whole Trinity. Christ is in us. The Spirit is in us, and God Himself is in us, to whom that very prayer is directed. Grace is God giving Himself. That's the idea. You are the temple of the Spirit of God. Christ dwells in you. God has set up His abode in you. And with His coming is not only the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. Uh, the virtues that are a part of the inheritance of the believer by the power of the Spirit, but what comes is illumination to understand the Word of God. But on top of that comes this special grace mentioned in verse 7 of chapter 4, which grants us a gift, a gift. A gift is literally measured out to us for the purpose of building up the body of Christ. As part of His self-giving, the Lord gives two kinds of gifts. The first one we're going to look at this morning is the gifts that He gives each Christian, each individual Christian. Then next week we'll come down to verse 11 and look at the gifts He gives the whole church. First the gifts He gives to every believer, then the gifts He gives to the whole church. But let's look at the, the individual believer in verses 7 to 10. And here we see the divine diversity necessary for unity. Now remember what I've said, the, the subject here is, is unity. That has been Paul's theme since chapter 2. And he wraps it up in a sense with the one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Then verse 7 begins with but, <clears throat> and that's used in an adversative way. In spite of everything that's been said about unity, on the other hand, on the other hand, we have been given grace, each one of us, in a unique way so that we function in diversity that produces this unity. Notice the word measure there, the measure of Christ's gift. That's metron in the Greek, metrics. The idea is the Lord gives every believer a specific portion, a specific unit of gifting so that He can contribute to the building of the body of Christ to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If you look at it down in verse 16, it's broken down into every joint and each individual part. The key to unity in the church is diversity, not political diversity, not sinful diversity, not ethnic diversity, not any of that. It's all irrelevant. The diversity we're talking about here is the diversity of gifts according to the measure of Christ's gift. He then uses an Old Testament passage to make His point. And I'll pick it up in verse 8. Therefore, 
therefore. In other words, connected to the point I've just made, I want you to understand that every believer by grace was given a gift from Christ measured out for that individual to build the body of Christ. Therefore, it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives and He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is Himself also He who ascended far above all the heavens so that He might fill all things. And I know you're saying to yourself, what what, what does that have to do with whatever He's talking about? Tell you what it has to do with, everything. This shows us the cost, mark it, the cost for Christ to give you the gift. You can't take it lightly. That, that, that's what Paul's going to show us. You, you may, at this particular point, not have any functioning role in the church. This will come to you as a, a shock, no doubt. But the Lord paid an astonishing price to be able to gift you so that you, for the common good, could help build the church into Christ's likeness for the glory of the One who paid the price. So let's go back to verse 8. You'll notice if you have a a Bible that identifies an Old Testament quote that this is taken from Psalm 68. So Paul is quoting Psalm 68. Now Psalm 68, this is verse 18 in Psalm 68. In Psalm 68, you have what I guess you could call a sort of a a triumphant, victorious psalm, the triumphant, victorious psalm, Uh, a, a victory hymn, maybe a better way to say it, composed by David to celebrate God conquering the Jebusite city and establishing the Ark of the Covenant on Mount Zion. The historical discussion of that is in 2 Samuel 6 and 7 and 1 Chronicles 13. So when the people of God came into the land, Jerusalem was a Jebusite city, a pagan city. God conquered the Jebusite city. Symbolically, the Ark of the Covenant was taken to the pinnacle of that city, Mount Zion. And God was the conqueror of that city, and it became Jerusalem. This is what kings did in ancient times. When they conquered, they went to a high point and declared their triumph. And this 68th Psalm is a triumphal hymn to honor God who conquered the city and ascended to reign over it. This was pretty common in ancient history. There would be generals who would go out and win a war, and they would come back. And the Romans used to call it a triumph, a triumph parade. Uh, The general would come back and he would bring with him the spoils of victory. There would be whatever they gained of the valuable things in that country represented by symbols of that value. There would be prisoners uh, that they would bring back from the captive country. They would bring back their own soldiers who had been imprisoned by the enemy and were set free, and they would all parade through the streets of the city to the highest point of the city. That's what they did. That's what the Roman generals did. It wouldn't be much different for any other nation in ancient times. An Israelite king would parade into Jerusalem in a victory parade bringing some of the captives with him and some of the spoils, and he would go to Mount Zion, which was the pinnacle. There would be victorious soldiers, and there would be the soldiers that the enemy had taken prisoner that then were recaptured by the king that owned them and had a right to them, and all of this would be a parade of triumph through the city. That's the picture here. Christ is pictured. He, verse 9, He ascended. He ascended. He ascended on high, according to Psalm 68. He went to the high place. Christ did this as a triumphant general. 
He ascended on high. This picks the triumphant Christ returning from the battle on earth. And what does He do? He brings with Him essentially the trophies of His conquest. It's a picture of the Son of God ascending triumphant to His throne. But, verse 9 says, this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He can't ascend unless He's descended. And that's exactly what this is saying to us. It's very powerful. I want you to notice one phrase, the lower parts of the earth. Before He went far above all the heavens, in verse 10, He went into the lower parts of the earth. What what does that mean? Well, essentially, it's it's a dramatic, dramatic statement. It's used four other places in Scripture, very instructively. It's used in Psalm 63, 9. And there, ascending to the lower parts of the earth had to do with death by murder, death by execution. It's also used a similar phrase in Matthew 12, 40, the heart of the earth, and it refers to the story of Jonah. And it refers to Jonah being in the belly of the fish. It's used in Isaiah 44, 23 to refer to the created earth, and it's used one more place, Psalm 139, 15, to speak about a womb, a child in the womb. Interestingly enough, those are the only other four uses of it, and they all have a connection to Christ. It's, it's really amazing. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. He was formed in the womb, Psalm 139. He lived on the earth, Isaiah 44. He was buried in a grave parallel to Jonah in the belly of the fish, and His death was an execution. That that very phrase points directly to Christ. Why all this? Because Paul wants us to understand the price he paid to be able to gift you. He had to be formed in the womb, live on earth, suffer all that he did, be executed, and be buried in order that He might ascend triumphantly to heaven. And only when He went back to heaven in triumph could He give gifts to men. He went back, verse 8, borrowing again from Psalm 68, He led captive a host of captives. In His descent into the earth, in His life and death and burial and resurrection, He took captive, you could say, the elect of God. And took them or their their right to heaven. He captured all who would ever live who were part of the elect. He won their right to be brought to God and to His kingdom because they belonged to Him. And then He gave gifts to men. He couldn't pass out the spiritual gifts until He entered into heaven at His ascension. Like a triumphant, conquering hero, He goes back with all the spoils, He arrives and is honored as the triumphant king, and then He begins to disperse the treasures. The the point is this. Your gifts didn't come easy, did they? The spoils that turn into the gifts of grace to each of us were won 
for the massive battle against Satan and a willingness to bear divine wrath. He ascended and He gave the gifts because He had descended and won the right to be called Lord. So when you think about the gift that you have, you should treasure that gift. He purchased that gift with His own life. End of verse 10, when He ascended far above all heavens so that He might fill all things. He went back triumphant. His glorious presence and power is expressed in universal sovereignty. So consider the, the grace of Christ in giving you salvation and giving you a gift to serve in His glorious church for His honor. As each one has received a gift, each one, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. There is grace again, manifold grace, varieties of grace have bestowed on every one of us a gift. Employ it in serving one another. It's not for you, it's for them. That's your stewardship. The cost was immense to provide that for you. And then Peter breaks the gifts into two simple categories, some speaking gifts and some serving gifts. Whoever speaks, do it as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves, do it as one serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things, what is the end of this in the church? God may be glorified through whom? Jesus Christ to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen." Again, Peter understands that the gifts, when they're used in the church, in the strength which God supplies, bring glory to Jesus Christ, which glory will redound forever and ever. And he says, Amen. That's the measure of the church. And that's what we strive for. To be an authentic church, it must be a light to the world and cannot be indistinguishable from darkness around us. Rediscover for yourself what our Lord demands of His church through Pastor John's book, Christ's Call to Reform the Church. Through Scripture, we see that Christ never exhorted His people to reform the culture of the day, but called for reformation within His church. This helpful resource along with numerous others, is available today by calling our operators at 888-57-GRACE or visiting our website, gty.org. As always, you can also reach out to us through email at letters at gty.org. We'd love to hear how the Lord is using this broadcast in your life and how we can be praying for you. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time on Grace to You.